It's truly wonderful for me to be back here in the King David School Hall, a place where I have enjoyed many occasions through which I've had the opportunity to address pupils, parents, and the Manchester community. I've been having a very fulfilling four-day visit to Manchester, and this particular moment is one that I cherish enormously. An opportunity here to be hosted by Yavne Yeshiva High School on the King David campus. An opportunity to welcome Skarsan Achinuch Shemidinat Israel together with other distinguished guests, friends, Chavrei Bnei Akiva and members of the Manchester community. And I have been looking forward to this opportunity to share thoughts for Divrei Torah for your Seder table of this year. So thank you very much for joining us for this occasion. Communication is of great importance to us. In the midst of the Seder, we ask the question, Chacham Mahu Omer, Rasha Mahu Omer, Tam Mahu Omer. We can actually identify the nature and characteristics of a person through that which the person says. What a person says stands out as the essence of that individual's personality. And the She'eno Yodea Lishol is somebody who is identified as a person who doesn't communicate or cannot communicate, and that as well speaks volumes, because sometimes an unsaid word makes a far greater impression than a spoken word. We're currently reading the parashiot of Tazria and Mitzorah. And we read yesterday how somebody who became impure through slander brings shtei tziporim chayot tohorot, an offering to the temple of two living birds. Why birds? Because the Hebrew term tzipor is an onomatopoeic word. It reflects to us the chirping sound of the bird. But why two birds? The Zohar HaKadosh tells us. One brings one bird for Lashon Hara and another bird for Lashon Hatov. This is an astonishing lesson. Lashon Hara we can understand. For all the evil speech, for all the malicious gossip that a person might have engaged in. But why Lashon Hatov? For good speech, you have to bring a korban as if to say sorry. And the best parish I've read is as follows. With regard to Lashon Hatov, here we're speaking about the absence of Lashon Hatov. When a person doesn't say something that's good, when you should be expressing your gratitude, when you should be mentioning words of praise, when you should be saying simple words such as I love you, to members of your family, but through the absence of that communication, harm can be caused, equal to the harm that can be caused through harmful speech. And therefore, within the process of our Haggadah experience, we recognize the power of speech and also the power of the absence of speech. And while speaking about the power of speech, let us look at the six key terms for communication in our Torah tradition. The first two are Omer and Midaber. What's the difference between the two? You can actually hear from the sounds of these words. Omer, Amira, it's light, it's pleasant, it's gentle. Dibur, Lidaber, it sounds harsh, sounds powerful. So Amira is regular conversation when people are speaking to each other as friends or acquaintances. Dibor is a formal presentation. Dibor is an announcement. It's a speech. It's a lecture. It's a drasha. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, time and time again, commands Moshe Rabbeinu, Daber al Bnei Yisrael ve'amarta alehem. Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, as a great spiritual leader, Hashem is saying to Moshe, you will only succeed to be a suitable shepherd of the nation if you engage in both Dibur and Amira. Dibur to make those formal statements of education and teaching and direction. And also Amira. A good leader needs to have the common touch. 
needs to be able to engage in everyday conversation with people, to take a genuine, empathic interest in their lives, to be in touch with them, and in that way, to make one's mark. Dibur and Amira must come together in our leadership as spiritual leaders, as national leaders, as educators, and also as parents and grandparents, to be the guides to our children and also the friends of our children. The third term for communication is tzivoy, litzavot, to command, to present that imperative through which there is an obligation. And we're well acquainted with the Tariag mitzvot, the 613 mitzvot of the Torah. The fourth term is lehodia, which means to inform from the root yada, knowledge, da'at. And to be modea is simply to convey information not so much in an enthusiastic nor in an emotional way, but simply to pass on information. That's why you have a newspaper called Hamodia, because it presents information. And then there are two last terms, and it's actually these two terms which are going to be the key terms for our Seder experience during Chag HaPesach. Our fifth term for communication is Lisaper to relate, to tell the story. Sipur. The Ikar of our Pesach experience is Sipur Yitziat Mitzrayim, the story of the exodus from Egypt. And you know, on the breastplate of the Kohen Gadol, there were 12 stones representing the 12 tribes. One of them was Sapir. And our English word, sapphire, comes from the biblical Sapir. And the sapphire stone sparkles. It is full of brilliance. It captivates the attention of those who are there, that is the power of the Sipur, of the story, to make us interested in what is being presented, to be part of that story. And sure enough, you know, when you recall various speeches and drashot that have been given in the past, you're far more likely to remember the stories than you are to remember the formal presentation of information. And if those stories are humorous, you'll remember them all the more so. And you know... Uh, we have another Hebrew word from the same root, which is lispor, to count. And uh, similarly in English, we recount and we count. We engage in lisaper and also lispor. And that is because to tell a good story, you need to count the words. Shouldn't be too long and shouldn't be too short. And I've been thinking overnight about another Hebrew word from the same root. And perhaps afterwards you can perhaps... Give me your suggestions. It's the Hebrew word for a barber. Sapar. So what's the connection between a barber and a story and counting? And my suggestion is, well, when it comes to a story, it needs to be just right. Sometimes you have to cut it short. Sometimes, uh, you know, it shouldn't be too long. Don't bore people. <laughs> Let it be the ideal length in order to have major impact. That is the art of the barber, to get it just right. So uh, that is the power of Sipur. And then we have the sixth term of communication, which is Lehagid, to tell, Hagada. And the root of Lehagid is Neged. Neged means in front of. A leader is a Nagid. And that is because the leader faces the nation to demonstrate to them what to do. You know, it's absolutely fascinating to see how Rabbanim sit in shuls. There are some shuls, particularly within Hasidic circles, where the Rav sits by the Mizrach wall with his back to the Kahal when he's sitting and also when he's standing. I think that's a beautiful procedure and practice because essentially the Rav or the Rebbe is saying to the Kahal, Acharai! After me, I'm here in front of you. Be with me. Follow me. And then there is a different practice. It's our own practice within our shuls, where the Rav faces the Kahal. And the idea is that he's there to demonstrate, to be in touch, to lead through example. That is what we engage in through Haggadah. So during our Seder experience, it's the last two terms which are the critically important ones, together with the others. First of all, Lissaper. We recognize 
that if we're going to succeed in imparting the values of our tradition and encouraging and inspiring the next generations to be true to that tradition, then they need to be engaged in an exhilarating and enthusiastic way. And we achieve this through the sipur, the stories of the background of our faith. And so you will find that the Maggid section of the Haggadah is full of such stories. And we embellish on these stories and we go to greater lengths. And we also relate to them other stories. And this is a signal for us throughout the entire year to tell those stories. And also we engage in a process of Haggadah demonstrating to children and grandchildren what the right way is. Not through saying to them, do as I say, but rather through conveying to them, do as I do. And as children and grandchildren sit at the Seder table and they're engaged in such a fun and happy way in the Seder experience, they are feeling their connection with the generations that have preceded them proud of their Jewish heritage, and we look to them to carry this forward through to the generations to come. So now I would, at this stage, like to pose seven questions to you. After all, Seder is all about questions. So what are my initial seven questions? Number one, we have at the beginning of our Seder the Seder. You know, the word Seder means order. It has to be in a particular order. Don't forget, our word for a prayer book is Sidur, which is also a particular order. Because every Sidur goes in the same order. In that way, you can pick up a Sidur and you can find your place immediately. So too, within the Seder, it's a set order. And we actually chant the Seder, and there are two items which actually are identical. Kadesh Urechatz. Number two is ant washing. And then we come to number six, which is rachza, washing. So there are two washing proceedings. One is kadesh urechatz, and wash. Karpas yachatz magid, rachza. And number six is washing. Why, why is one and wash, and the other is rachza, mere washing as an independent act? Question number two. That actual initial washing, the urechatz. Why do we do it? You know, in many families, only the person leading the Seder carries out the washing. Goes to the kitchen, or somebody brings the bowl to him. What's it for? We're not going to make a motzi afterwards. We're not going to be eating uh, matzah. So why do we have it at all? Question number three, the actual eating that follows, which is karpas. Why do we dip the vegetables in salt water? Why is it necessary to eat at that stage? And then... There is a custom which is widespread, and you'll notice it in your Haggadot. Just before Manishtana, the instruction, the rubric is, we remove the Seder tray from the table. So you take your Seder tray and you put it on the side, off the table. Why? Surely it makes a lot of sense that at a time when parents are instructing their children about the beauty of our tradition and we're going to engage in this audiovisual presentation, you need the items there in front of you. But at this pivotal moment when the child is asking the questions, we remove these items off the table. And at the end of Manishtana, when we come to Avadi Mayinu, we return them to the table. My fifth question relates to Afikoman. Where did we get this idea from? That Afikoman involves the hiding of matzah and the search for matzah. There are a few different views as to what Afikoman means. The most prevalent one is that it relates to Dessert from the Mishnah, you shouldn't have leftovers after the Paschal Lamb, and that actually is a halacha for us on Seder night. For some people, it's quite a challenge. At the end of the Seder, you cannot go into the kitchen in order to nibble leftovers. Once you've had that afikoman, the last item to eat before benching, that's it, until the next kiddush of the following morning. That's the halacha of afikoman, so where do we get the idea of the hiding of it, the searching for it? In some families, the children hide and the parents find. In other families, the parents hide and the children find. What's it all about? Question number six, halal. We've got a procedure of full halal. Sometimes it's half halal, which is not actually half halal. It's minus two paragraphs. 
But what do we find at the Seder? We say two paragraphs of the Hallel, a huge break for a meal, and afterwards, after benching, we continue Lolano with a continuation of the Hallel. How can we have such a deep, significant break right in the middle of this one item? And my concluding seventh question is, why those nursery rhymes at the end of the Haggadah? You know, if you have a Haggadah full of perushim, full of commentaries, it'll be top-heavy before the meal. And then as you go towards the end, fewer and fewer perushim, and right at the end you'll just have the full version of the Haggadah with no commentaries. So why do we have them at all? Can we really find some meaning in those nursery rhymes? I'm going to be answering all seven questions with one single concept. You see, in the Torah we read, When your children ask you questions, you need to respond, You must engage in a process of Haggadah for your children to demonstrate to them what happened at the time of the Exodus. Consequently, our entire Seder experience is totally child orientated. And what we do, and this is the Perush of Abarbanel, my favorite Perush in his Perush Zevach Pesach, which is now available in English commentary. I highly recommend it to you. Abarbanel, Abarbanel explains as follows What we try to do is to create a context on Seder night which is parallel to a regular Friday night or Yom Tov evening experience. You come home from Shul. What's on everybody's mind, especially the children's mind? Food. We're human. Mummy's been busy in the kitchen, probably for weeks talking about the meal, for days preparing the meal, and now the big moment has come. So you're looking forward to a lovely Yom Tov meal. And everything is the way it usually is. You're around the table. You can smell the beautiful, beautiful smell of, of the fruit from the kitchen. Father makes kiddush, just as usual. Then we wash the hands. Regular procedure. Aha. Uh -huh. And then there's a bit of food. And now what's going to come? Of course, the whole meal. And at that point, we take the food off the table. That's when the rubric says, remove the Seder tray from the table. And the child should cry out and say, What's going on here? Why is this night different? I'm looking forward to a lovely meal, and what's in front of us is books. It's now a classroom in our dining room. Therefore, Barabanel says, in this way, we encourage the children to be inquisitive and to cry out and to notice differences. And sure enough, by second night, they would have remembered what happened first night. Or if by next year, they remember what happened the last year. But this is a key indication to us how to educate our children throughout the year. Create situations which will encourage them to ask questions so that we can engage with them in a process of Jewish tradition and law. So we've already answered our first four questions. Kadesh Urechatz. You have the Vav to link the washing to the Kiddush because it's the continuation of a process that starts. And then you have afterwards, uh, you eat the Karpas in order to start eating so that you've got a bit of a meal to get it going and then you remove the Seder tray so that the child will ask questions. So why then do we have Afikoma? Our Seder experience is our prime Jewish example of outstanding education. And one of the greatest challenges that good educators have, actually all educators have, is the hyperactive child. How to deal with a child who simply has no zitzflesh. Now I'll tell you the way not to deal with that child, to insist that the child should sit still for a whole lot of hours. Recipe for disaster. The best way to treat that child is Child's going to be busy and hyperactive. Okay, give that child something constructive, something positive to do to utilize his or her hyperactivity in. And that's what we do through the Afikoma. We make it legitimate to take your eyes off the book, to hide something, to search for something, to engage in another activity. And in this way, you can feel totally at home even though you're not as serious as others might be when it comes to their studies. I think this is a brilliant way of approaching all of our children, their needs, their potential, their likes and their dislikes, and their disposition towards learning. And again, we have our children in mind when it comes to the break in the Hallel. 
Fascinatingly, this is the machloket between Shammai and Hillel. Shammai says, we only say the first paragraph of the Hallel before the meal. Hillel says, no, we say the first two paragraphs. Fascinating. It seems that Hillel here is more strict than Shammai. Actually, I would like to suggest that Shammai is more strict than Hillel. Why? Because Shammai here is strict when it comes to our consideration for our children. You see, our rabbis recognize both Hillel and Shammai that, okay, we've had our lessons. We've engaged in the market. We're coming towards the meal. Don't serve that meal too late. Don't punish good people. They're here at the Seder. They want to experience a positive entity of their faith. Don't wait. make them wait for too long. That's why we start the Halil to praise God, but we break it for the meal. Shammai says, just say the first paragraph. We're strict for the sake of our children. Rush into the meal. Hillel says, Shammai, I agree with you, but what is the second paragraph? Betzeit Yisrael mimitzrayim. It's all about the exodus from Egypt. This is an integral part of Makit. You cannot divorce it from this passage and have it after the meal. And we follow the ways of Hillel. And I think here there is another powerful message relating to our Seder experience. You know, every time I come into Shul on Pesach morning, immediately after saying good yontav to people, there's a question that is asked. What's the question that everybody asks after saying good yontav? The question is, at what time did you finish the Seder? <laughs> now, my question to you is, which answer makes a person sound more from? <laughs> the person who says 11 p.m. or the one who says 4 a.m.? And my answer is, it depends. Yes, the 4 a.m. person, wow, what a fantastic family that person must have. Engaging in Divrei Torah, rejoicing in the festival of Pesach, isn't it wonderful? But you know, the 11 p.m. family, they could be great tzaddikim. Maybe there's an old grandfather who wants to be there to the very end, but he's not that well. Maybe they're little children whom you have to be mindful of, and they want to reach the end of the Seder. So why make it impossible for them? Empathy is so crucially important. So don't punish people by making it too late. And you know, we're so blessed that our children and our grandchildren, from their schools, they come with these huge machparot, dozens of divrei Torah, and they're chalishing to say every single one of them, and that's every single child around the table, you'll go on till 6, 7 a.m. You have to work out a system beforehand. Allocate, okay, you'll do two, or you'll do three, that's it, choose which ones. Have an order, have a discipline around the table so that you'll maximize the experience. And as a result, it shouldn't be too long. And that's why we break the Hallel. And this leads me to the answer to our final question, which is given in the same vein. We want to provide an incentive for people to stay up right to the end. And that's what those nursery rhymes are about. It's an occasion for us as a family to rejoice if we want to, to let our hair down, to have family melodies, traditions, what we do, something that the children will remember from previous years and they'll definitely want to stay awake for this time round. That's why they are there, with the children in mind and also for us, the adults, who will always remain children at heart. And consequently, that's why we have those passages at the end of the Seder to end it on a high. And you know, I must tell you, while we all aspire to live Bezrat Hashem in Medinat Yisrael, at the end of the first Seder, I always say, Baruch Hashem, we got another one. Wouldn't it be such a great pity? Just one, and it's over, and it's behind us. I, I'm speaking here as a man, not as the women have to prepare the, the other Seder. <laughs> so we've got two opportunities in Chutz La'aretz in order to rejoice and to celebrate that great Seder experience. Let me now move on to a Dvar Torah relating to the Karpas procedure. So we've mentioned the washing of hands straight after Kiddush, and then we take a vegetable and we dip it in salt water. Karpas, what word is this? Where does it come from? And what does this dipping remind us of? You might know that the word Karpas appears in the Bible. We read it just two weeks ago in Megillat Esther, Chur Karpas Utechelet, a Vargaman, a description of the various linens that were used, the materials that were used 
in the palace of King Ahasuerus. And if you have a look at Perush Rashi, in Breshit, Perik Lamed Gimel, Pasuk Gimel, Genesis chapter 33, verse 3, there you will see that Rashi explains, through the usage of an Aramaic term, that the Ktonet Pasim, the coat of stripes that Jacob gave to his son Joseph, was made out of karpas. That was the material that was used for this coat. And the Talmud Yerushalmi has a tradition which tells us that the dipping of karpas, and by the way, interestingly, the Yerushalmi refers to dipping of the vegetable into charoset, that's not our minhag, but the significance of it, says the Yerushalmi, is to remember the dipping of Joseph's coat into blood. Following which the brothers came back to their father Yaakov and they said, Chayara'a, Chalato, a wild animal has devoured your son. Here is proof. There is a very powerful message that emerges from our first dipping at the Seder, which comes to remind us of the earliest dipping of significance in our history. The Seder is all about how we left Egypt. But we start the Seder with a message of how we got into Egypt in the first place. And how did we get into Egypt? It was because of Sinat Chinam, rivalry between brothers, disunity within a dysfunctional family, as a result of which there was attempted fratricide. It was the breach in the Achdut and the Shalom of our people at the time which led us into that Galut, into that Egyptian exile. And therefore, at the beginning of the Seder, we're given a message about the importance of Jewish unity. And indeed, this is a theme central to the festival of Pesach. The Korban Pesach, the Paschal Lamb offering, had to be totally consumed. So the whole animal had to be eaten at a Seder. <laughs> what did that mean? It meant that you needed a lot of people who were eating together for this purpose, a few dozen. Consequently, every family, according to Halakha, in Yerushalayim, to celebrate Pesach, had to actually join with other families, had to invite people to join them, in order that they will fulfill the Halakha of consuming the entire animal. And that's why in our tradition, that's where it all started. Seder is not a time where ideally you're at home by yourself or just your inner family circle. It's a time when you invite people over, you dream, you experience this within the Chabura, within a group. Our Seder, our Pesach experience is all about Achdut, bringing people together as one. And that is why as we approach the festival, we engage in Pinchas the Kimcha, that uh, we give charitable contributions towards others and we ensure Everybody will have a place at which to enjoy a Seder. There is a second powerful message from the fact that we remember the dipping of Joseph's coat. As I have already explained, our Seder is all about good parenting and we start the Seder experience with the finest biblical example of poor parenting by Jacob, who selected one child to be his favorite. Parents never ever do that and never ever think that way. All children need to be equal in your eyes. And this too is an important message of our Haggadah experience. Later in the evening, we refer to the four sons and in the preamble, Baruch HaMakom Baruch Hu, we say, the Torah speaks to engages with Four different types of children. Echad chacham, ve'echad rasha, ve'echad tam, ve'echad shaneod elishol. And I ask, why all the echads? One who is wise, one who is bad, one who is simple, one who doesn't know how to ask. Just say, chacham rasha tam, ve'shenoyod elishol. But the powerful message here is that every single one of our children equals echad. The chacham, the child whom we're proud of, of his progress. Of his piety, he's equal to Echad, he's one in our eyes. The Rasha, the child who lets us down, the child over whom his environment has an impact, as a result of which he's drawn away from our tradition, who does things to disappoint us, that child too is Echad. He is our flesh and blood, he's part of our Mishpacha. He's precious always in our eyes. Echad Tam, this simple child doesn't it? have incredible experiences, interested in simple things. That child is the Chachinoyot Elisho, the one who has special educational needs, is also Echad. Every child is Echad. Nobody should be favored above anyone else. And you know, uh, we find that 
when Moshe Rabbeinu was blessed with two children, the way that the Torah puts it in Parshat Shmot is Shem HaEchad Gershom Shem HaEchad Eliezer. The name of the one was Gershom and the name of the one is Eliezer. Why do you say Shem HaEchad Shem HaEchad? At the time of creation, we're told, Vayyere Vayvoker Yom Echad. There was night and day in the first day. Vayyere Vayvoker Yom Sheini, Yom Shlishi, second day, third day. So we should have been told the name of the, Moses' first son was Gershom, Moses' second son was Eliezer, but it's not. Shem HaEchad Gershom for Shem HaEchad Eliezer. And the reason is, in Moses' eyes, both of his sons were only children. There was a one and only Gershon and a one and only Eliezer. Each one was equal to Echad. That's the lesson we learn from Jacob's era at the beginning of what should be a good parenting experience through the Haggadah. Let me now go on to the next passage, and that is Halachma Ania. We display the matzah. And we say, this is Lachma Ania, which our forefathers ate in the land of Egypt. Let anyone who is hungry come in and join us. Anyone who is needy, come and partake of the Paschal Lamb sacrifice. And then we say, we're here this year. L'shana haba'a ba'arat Yisrael. Next year, may we all be in Israel. Hashata avde, this year we are enslaved to others. L'shana haba'a b'nei chorin. Next year, may we all be free, liberated people. You'll notice the language of Halachma. It's not Hebrew. It's Aramaic. And interestingly, therefore, the Seder starts with a passage in Aramaic and it concludes with a passage in Aramaic, which is the Chad Gadya, the vernacular of our people at the time. And this, too, conveys an important message about Haggadah. Haggadah is all about understanding. You can only impart education if people understand. That doesn't mean to say that we should always dip down to the lowest common denominator in order to make our teaching shallow. No, sometimes we should give presentations of a high level in order to raise the aspirations of people so that they will raise the bar of their own educational excellence. But you can't properly teach if people don't understand what you are saying. Therefore, part of the Haggadah is in the vernacular. You know, here in the UK, from medieval times, we don't unfortunately have a strong tradition of rabbinic teaching. On the continent, there's a very strong tradition. But due to persecution and the fact that we were expelled from this country in 1290, the result is we have very little evidence of Torah teaching here. There is one single lesson in the Shulchan Aruch in the name of Rabbi Yaakov Milondre, Rabbi Jacob of London. And what is that teaching of his? The halacha he presents us with as codified in Shulchan Aruch is it is permissible to recite the Haggadah in the vernacular. Why? Because people need to understand. Of course the ideal is recited all in the Hebrew and then you can give some translations. But it is totally in order for people around the table to read passages in English in order that we should all understand. Of course, when it comes to the brachot, anything which is Davah Shebikdusha and the mitzvot that we uh, practice, that should, of course, all be in Hebrew. But the crucial message here is, when we teach, the pupils should understand. Now, what do we mean by the term lachma ania? And Abar Banel tells us that there are different ways of approaching it. The first is that Lachma Ania is the bread of affliction. But it's very interesting because the Torah tells us that we were in such a rush to leave the land of Egypt that there wasn't enough time for the uh, yeast to rise, and that's why we have matzah. But actually, from Ha Lachma, we're told, this was the daily bread of our people in Egypt. This is what the slaves were given by the Egyptians. This was a Lachma Ania, bread of affliction. And then there's a second view, a very different one, of Shmuel in the Gemara. Shmuel says, Lachmaniyah doesn't come from the word oni, which is affliction, rather it comes from la'anot, which is to answer. Says Shmuel, this is the bread over which we give our answers. And I think this is such a beautiful teaching. Because we make a big fuss about the questions at the Seder. We also need to remember, we need to give good answers. And also, the way in which we answer is of significance. Because we shouldn't put our children off through sniggering at some of the questions that they ask or suggesting this is not a good enough question or I don't have enough time for your questions. We need to encourage their questions 
and to respect them through giving them decent answers and through being patient with them. The Gemara in Masechet Shabbat Taflamid tells us that famous story about Hillel. There were people who decided to irritate him, and one person came the Erev Shabbat on the eve of Shabbat to get him out of the bath time and time again and to pose ridiculous questions to him. And Hillel always answered, and he said, Beni she'ila gedola she'alta, my son, you've asked a great question. That's how we need to relate to questions. That's the lachma ania. It's the bread over which we give good answers and we relate in a healthy way to the questioner. There's a third way of approaching this. Lachma ania refers to the broken piece of matzah because just before the halachma, we break the matzah and half of it goes towards the afikomen and half we will eat at the meal. And therefore this is broken bread. It's the bread of affliction, the bread that slaves have. And for me, we have echoes of our concentration camp experiences so similar to our experience in Egypt where the inmates were given a piece of bread a day and there are so many stories about those pieces of bread how people would nibble them right through the day how people would hide them within the seams of their clothes how very righteous people would share their bread with others and today we are spoiled rotten how much bread do we throw out that we don't manage to eat and goes into the bin how much bread do bakeries just toss out when they bake too much and we recall a time when people appreciated every tiny bit of bread they had. Lachma ania. And then there is a fourth parish which is as follows. Usually, bread is the king of all foods. That's why when you make a motzi, it covers all the foods that follow. There's one exception. In temple times, when they had the paschal lamb offering the korban pesach, because of the enormity of the significance of that mitzvah, the korban pesach, became the king of food at that meal. And therefore, at the Seder alone, bread is a bit of an orphan. It's not the king of all foods. It's the lachma ania. It takes second place. One final point from ha lachma, which I believe is very relevant to us. Why is it that the passage is in Aramaic, but towards the end, leshana haba'a, that's Hebrew. So we've got Hebrew interwoven with the Aramaic. There are some who say, we're worried about the authorities in the countries in which we live in Chutzlaretz. They'll hear, Lishana haba'a b'nei chorin. We, the Jewish people, are planning next year to be liberated, to be free. We're all going on mass aliyah. What's happening to the Jewish people will... I mean, all they have to do really is to ask a question or to find out that we've said this every single year and nothing has happened since then. Not the greatest... Uh, explanation. There are those who explain, we don't want to upset the children. A child will read, next year we're going to be in Jerusalem. He'll say, but what about my friends? You know, I like it where I am. Well, why upset children unnecessarily? So therefore, they under understand the vernacular, put the details about Shana, Ba'a, hopefully be in Yerushalayim, put that in Hebrew language they don't understand. Again, this is not the greatest parish. Baruch Hashem, today our children understand Hebrew. In fact, they understand Hebrew better than, than they understand Aramaic. So we need a better explanation than this. And my favorite one is as follows. This passage, Halachma, represents our life in Chutzlaretz, in the diaspora. We live with the vernacular on our lips and with Lashon HaKodesh on our lips. We're part of our environment which has an impact on us and we are loyal to our Jewish traditions. We're living here we have one foot in Medinat Yisrael, and we long for the day of Lishana Haba'a Ba'arat Yisrael, when once again all of Am Yisrael will be through a time of Geula living in our own country in Zion. It's such a powerful message for us. Now, some comments on Manishtana. We refer to Manishtana as being the Fir Kash, is the four questions, but my challenge to you is. Try and find four questions in the Manishtana. They're not there. <laughs> We're saying, Manishtana halayla hazeh. You know, how different is this night? In what way is it different? And we're giving four examples of differences. So there's one question with four answers. Also, in actual fact, the Manishtana shouldn't really have a question mark after it. It should have an exclamation mark. Manishtana halayla hazeh. How different this night is. So why do we refer to this passage as being a passage of questions. Abarbanel explains as follows. The children notice that there is something 
unusual at the Seder table. During our calendar year, either we have celebrations or we have times of mourning. Either we celebrate or we grieve. But at the Seder table, we have a fusion of the two. Symbols of our freedom and symbols of our slavery. What sense can you make of it? And that is why in the Manishtana, there are two examples of slavery, which are the Matzah and the Maror, and two examples of our liberty, which is reclining and dipping. In order to provide for the children that tension between two different types of moods around the Seder table. And therefore, the children should say, Manishtana Halayla, this night is different. What's it all about? It's not a pure celebration. It's not pure mourning. And the answer comes, Avadim hayinu lefarob Mitzrayim. We were slaves unto Pharaoh in Egypt, and that's why we grieve. Vayotzeinu Hashem lokenu misham, but God liberated us from there, and that is why we celebrate. Interestingly, the Rambam, in his tradition, instructed parents to recite Manishtana. On what basis? You see, the Mishnah in Masechet Pesachim says, we understand it to be, and here the child asks, Manishtana, and the father gives the answers through Avadim Hayinu. The Rambam says, ben Shoel. let's get the children to ask their questions before Manishtana, in the spirit of what we've been telling until now. And the father should now say, ah, these are the differences, and this is the instruction I'm giving you. Consequently, in the Rambam's home, you had no practices for children at school, uh, leading up to the Seder, who's going to sing the Manishtana, will the child be shtum, will the child have the courage to open his or her mouth, what's going to happen, you know, all the build-up to it. The Rambam didn't have any of that. The parents said the Manishtana, and uh, that was his tradition, and I guess from our point of view, fortunately for us, we have more fun, and we don't go in that way. I would like to share a few brief comments with you now from some of the other passages of the Seder and the rest we will leave, Bezrat Hashem, to the years that will follow. In the Arba Abanim, the four children, and by the way, I prefer to say the four children rather than the four sons. Torah education is not just for our sons, it's for all of our children. And therefore, all of these caricatures, these uh, drawings that you have in the Haggadah, usually it's Four different men, it should be men and women, you know. Banim atem l'ashem elokechem, you are the children of the Lord your God, that means everybody. Of course, banim can sometimes mean sons, can sometimes mean children here, it must certainly mean our children. We need to teach all of our children. So in the Arba Banim, the four children, what is our response to the Rasha? Va'afata hakhei et shina. The Rasha places himself out of the ambit of the community because he says, what is all this to do with you? And not, he doesn't include himself. It's difficult to translate it. Many English translations read, and you shall set his teeth on edge. I don't know what that means, so I wonder if you know. Many others translate it to mean, and you shall knock his teeth out. Now I do understand what that means. <laughs> But is there any sense to it? There's a beautiful parish of the Haggadah called Lerman's Passover Haggadah, written in the 19th century in Germany. Get hold of it. It's beautiful. He writes marvelous, Rabbi Dr. Marcus Lerman, marvelous essays. And this is how he explains, The response to a difficult child is not to become physical with him or her. But rather we say to the child, imagine what it would be like to try and eat food without teeth. So therefore, theoretically, ask him, try and imagine a mouth without teeth. Would you be able to swallow? After all, you're not giving yourself first the chance to chew. And the lesson for the Rasha is, you are trying to judge Jewish law purely on the basis of logic and rationale. If it makes sense, I'll digest it. If not, I'll reject it. The message to the Rasha is Kol diber Hashem na'aseh v'nishma Am Yisrael et Har Sinai said everything that Hashem has said we will do and then we will understand. You can only fully digest and appreciate Torah law and our tradition if first you chew on it. If you engage fully and enthusiastically in the practice of mitzvot and as a result 
you'll be able to appreciate its beauty and its timeless re relevance. When I was studying years ago in Yeshivat Kerem Beyavne, my Rosh Yeshiva, Rav Chaim Goldwicht, once gave us a beautiful perush. It was the very first time in which he had left Israel to go to Chutz Laretz. One of the Talmidim in the Yeshiva came from Antwerp, and he was celebrating his wedding. The Rosh Yeshiva was invited to officiate at the wedding in Antwerp, and he came back from Antwerp, and in his first sicha to the yeshiva, he said, in Antwerp I discovered why our code of Jewish law is called the Shulchan Aruch. Now that's quite a statement. What did he experience to explain why our code of law is called Shulchan Aruch? Shulchan Aruch, by the way, is another term from our Seder experience, the laid table. So what's the connection? And the Rosh Hashiva explained, after the chuppah, he was brought into a banqueting hall. He was seated at the main table, and in front of him there were 18 pieces of cutlery. No food yet, just the 18 pieces of cutlery. And he turned to the local Rav, who was sitting on his side, and he said, I can't believe that there's going to be any usage. 18, all right, two, three, four, maybe, 18. And the local Rav said, look, to be honest, I can't tell you for certain what these pieces of cutlery will be used for, but I'm here at the Ismachot week in and week out, and I guarantee you that after three, four, or five hours, all the pieces of cutlery will be gone. My only advice to you is tuck in. Enjoy yourself. So they brought on a salad, and then a pie, and then a quiche, and then uh, some soup, interspersed with divrei Torah and dancing, and then another salad, and then a main course, and then uh, whatever. You get the message. And at the end of the meal, all the pieces of cutlery were gone, said the Rosh Yeshiva. When it comes to our Shulchan Aruch, somebody who is uninitiated, somebody who has no experience in appreciating the beauty of our tradition, wants to know, what is Jewish law all about? And he or she looks at the Shulchan Aruch, and they are meaningless tools. If you want to get meaning in life, if you want to come close to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, put a box on your head and a box on your arm. Eat some cardboard bread for seven days a year. Sit under some foliage. Wave around a palm branch. That's what will make you holy. And the person says, I can't believe, the person says to somebody who's been doing all this a long time, I can't believe that it's got meaning. And the person says, look, I'm not exactly sure how to explain it to you, but I do these things every day. Tuck in. Try it. You'll see. It'll become very meaningful. That's the meaning of the pasuk. Ta'amu ure'u kitov Hashem. Taste and you will see that Hashem is good. First you have to taste it. This is the message to the Rasha. This is the message we can give to all those doubters who criticize from the outside. If only you would chew on Jewish law, if only you would be fully engaged, if only you would have Shabbat and Yom Tov and Daven and practice all of the mitzvot, including Tarata Mishpacha and all the beautiful ways of our tradition, you will digest it. You will appreciate it. You won't need any explanations at all. That's the beauty of our Shulchan Aruch. And a few words about the She'eno Yodei Alishol. The She'eno Yodei Alishol is probably one of the most challenging situations we come across. She'eno Yodei Alishol could mean an infant who doesn't yet know how to ask, could be an older person who's limited in respect of their learning capacity, could be a person who is a mere shadow of his or her past because of difficulties which have occurred, a loss of memory, or various immobility issues. And what we want such people to know and the families of such people to know is the Echad Sheino Yodei Alishol. The Sheino Yodei Alishol has a place around our Seder table. That person is equal to Echad. That person is equal to one, similar to everyone else. There's a fascinating Gemara in Masechet Brachot which tells us what happened after Moshe Rabbeinu smashed the tablets when he came down on the first time from Har Sinai and he saw the worshipping of the golden calf. And there the Gemara tells us that Hashem instructed Moshe to stoop down and to collect all the pieces, the broken pieces of those first tablets. And they were stored. And we're told, Luchot, the Shivrei Luchot, Munachim Baron, in the Ark of the Covenant that eventually was placed in Solomon's temple inside that Ark, we had the tablets, the second tablets of the Ten Commandments, together with all the pieces of the first tablets, they had equal kedusha, the same level of sanctity. And I believe there's a message for us here, that the luchot, people who are whole, people who are shalem, people who have full potential, they have kedusha, 
and also the Shivrei Luchot, people who are fragments of what they once were, or people who never became what they might have been, they too have the same Kedusha. They're part of the essence of Am Yisrael. And those She'eno Yodea Lishol individuals have a full place around our table, and we must relate to them within our communities with absolute love, with total patience, with affection, to do whatever we can for them. And now an idea about the He She'amda. And this is going to be my concluding thought of the Shi'ur. Sorry, there's not time for more. Vehi she'amda lavoteinu velano. It is this which has stood by our forefathers and by us. Shelo echad amad bil... Alein... You know what? Didn't only happen once. In the days of Pharaoh, that there was an attempt to annihilate the Jewish people, to subjugate us. Ela shebechor dov adorom dimalein velchaloteinu. In every generation, v'akadosh baruch hu matzileinu miyadam and Hashem saves us. But you know, the passage doesn't explain to us what the vehi is. Vehi she'amda. It is this which has stood by us. What's the vehi? So the Maharal of Prague gives the following brilliant insight. He says we can learn vehi, the four letters of vehi, from the echad miyodea at the end of the Seder. The vav of vayehi stands for number six. Shisha sidre mishnah. It is our oral tradition in the Talmud. The hey is five. Chamisha chum shetorah, the written Torah. The Yud, Asara Dibraya, the Ten Commandments, and Aleph is Echad, which is one, Echad Elokeinu, one God. These are the four things which have stood by us throughout the generations to guarantee that Am Yisrael Chai, the Jewish people, will have the capacity to live on. I'd like to add an insight into this. Notice the order. First of all, Shisha Sidra Mishnah. You know, there are many people who believe in one God, you ask them, how many mitzvot are there in the Torah? Ten. And you'll say, no, there's 613. And you'll think, they'll think you're crazy. Where does that come from? We only know about ten commandments. And then there are some who are familiar with the 613 commandments, the written Torah. Talmud doesn't mean much to them. When it comes to the survival of Am Yisrael, the first ingredient that we mention is the Vav, the Shisha Sidre Mishnah. It's an understanding in depth of our tradition. To grapple with issues to ask questions and hopefully to come up with suitable answers through the oral presentation of our law according to our authentic tradition. And then comes the hey, the Chamisha Chum Torah, the whole of the written Torah, all 613 commandments. And then Asara Dibraya, the Ten Commandments, and then Echad Elokeinu, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, who keeps us going. A mere belief in Hashem, which of course is wonderful and suitable and appropriate and correct, will not be sufficient to keep Am Yisrael alive. In order to keep us going from generation to generation, we need education. We need understanding. We need outstanding chinuch. And that is why I'm so pleased that I have the privilege today to have presented this shiur in a place of outstanding education. The Yavne Yeshiva High School in Manchester, part of the King David campus, one of the most outstanding educational enterprises beyond the Jewish community in the whole of the UK. I congratulate you all on your educational expertise and achievements. And I thank every one of you for coming with me in an experience of education. Because the more education we have, the more Talmud Torah we have, the better will be our chances to have a thriving, great, and successful future here in the UK and throughout the Jewish world. I wish you all Chag Kasher V'Sameach.